what an exciting music that we had this morning. Thank you all for your practice. And your discipline. Would you all please pray with me? Father, today is the day that uh, we have set aside that we don't forget that our freedom is constantly being challenged. This American experiment has been a wonderful thing that we have no close enemies. And Father, you have protected us because this nation was founded on Christian principles. Oh, we were never a Christian nation, but we are a nation that was founded on Christian principles. And when they are followed, we discover that your word works. We're a wealthy nation because we understand Christian principles of working hard and saving, looking out for one another's needs and taking care of those who need help. And Father, those things today are more at risk than ever. And so, Lord, we pray for this great country that you would give us leaders who would be bold to stand, to stand for what's right, to understand that they all will give an account to you. And Lord, we ask for freedom, that freedom would remain. We ask for freedom of religion. We ask, Lord, that you would protect the churches in America. We ask, Lord, that you would watch over us. And Lord, we thank you for the many, many, many shoulders that we stand on, men and women who worked in the armed services, all of them signed a blank check, including even up to taking their own lives to fight for our freedom. And we don't forget them. We pray today and thank you for each one. We thank you for those uh, who now are, and we pray for those who now are suffering because they have lost a loved one. Lord, I pray that our country, our government would come alongside those who need that help in a big way. We also pray for our many soldiers who are coming back with PTSD. Some of them are not normal. They are greatly scarred. They have emotional scars. And Lord, we pray for them. We pray that you would set men and women alongside of them who would love them and care for them and help them to get back what they lost. Lord, watch over them. Our heart breaks for them. And Lord, we ask. Now, Lord... We pray also um, for Bill Holbrook and the surgery that he had on Friday for his skin cancer. We ask that you would heal him. And Lord, we thank you for his participation and his dedication to this church. Now, Lord, I ask that you would speak through me. I have prayed all week. Speak to me, Lord, because I need a touch from you. I need your word to guide me daily. So thank you for your word. I would be in such a much worse place if I did not have your guidance daily. Thank you, Father, that you are our God, our strength. You are the rock that we stand on. You are the fortress that surrounds us. You are our deliverer. You're a rock in whom we seek refuge. And so, Lord, I ask that you would watch over and speak through me now. Speak to through your servant, for your people want to hear your word. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Autopsies. We're all familiar with them. We don't know much about them. We just know what happens. We know that whenever there is a suspicious death, there's going to be an autopsy. And in comes a trained medical examiner. He steps in with an insatiable curiosity. He steps in with a sharp mind and a keen eye. With patience and dexterity, he works diligently, examining organs, examining the uh, body completely, until he finally comes to a conclusion, and he knows what the cause of death was. We know that. But there's another kind of autopsy that you may not be familiar with. And that is the autopsy of a church. As a matter of fact, there's a book written about it. And it's called Autopsy of a Deceased Church. Now that may sound ridiculous to us. But you need to know 
that there are in America more than 100,000 churches that we would define as being sick, even very sick. That for that matter, today, at the close of today, on average, there will be 100 to 200 churches in America will close their doors for the last time, dead. By the end of 2018, that means that we will have 6,000 to 10,000 less churches in America because they died. It's an epidemic, folks. Now, we can sit here and we can say, well, it's because of the government or it's because of the evil times or it's because of the pressures from outside. But I assure you, if the problems were from outside uh, pressure, there would not be any church today. The church has always been under battle, even from the beginning. And so we must look within. We must look within the church to find the cause. And so this morning, that's what we're going to do. We're going to look within the church to see what is not there. If you would, open up your Bibles to the book of Acts. Book of Acts, chapter 2. We're going to begin in verse 41. Acts, chapter 2. We're going to ask and answer the question, what's wrong? Now to do that, what we need to do is go back to the prototype church. The prototype church, the first church and see what did God instill in that church, what did he infuse in that church to make it flourish under extreme pressure. I remind you that this church was started some 50 days after Jesus had been crucified. In the very same city where he was crucified. Do you think there wasn't some pressure there? Two weeks ago, I preached a message on why church? And in that, we looked at seven M's. The first M was motivation. What's the motivation for the church? Is the church, our organization that you see all throughout the world, is that a human design? Is that something that we dreamed up? Some people would say yes. Everybody has what they look to to help calm them in difficult times. Some people go to drugs, some people go to alcohol, some people go to something else, and we go to religion. Now, we know that's not true. So, what is the motivation for the church? And we looked at Matthew chapter 28. And in Matthew 28, Jesus came to the disciples and he said, All authority has been given to me. I own it all. I'm in charge of it all. You don't need to go past, past me. Go. Make disciples. And so, the motivation came from... The Lord Jesus Christ, who is the judge, gave us total permission and said, build it. We also look at the mission. What is the mission? Make disciples, make learners, be reaching and teaching people for Jesus Christ. Then we look at the map. Where are we to carry that out? Right here. Right here, both here and out of here. And what Jesus had told them, not only in Jerusalem, but in Judea, and in Samaria, and even to the outer reaches. But it must happen here. So we've looked at the mission, we've looked at the map. What was the message? Very simply, it's the gospel. And we looked at it and we said, what is the gospel? We said, well, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 to 3 tell us 10 words. Christ died for our sins and rose from the dead. That's the message that was given to the church. And then we look at the madness of the church. And the madness of the church, quite frankly, is we listen to God, but we don't obey Him. And so we get our own ideas on what we should do. This is causing many churches to shut down. And then we look at the method. The method of the church is love. Jesus said, love God, love others. That's the method. It's not through us being self-righteous, condemning other people, saying well, you, they can't live up to things that we can't live up to, and we have the Holy Spirit. We are not the judges. We do this through love. 
And then the last thing we looked at was the muscle. What's the muscle behind the church? Well, it would be Jesus Christ. He said, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So we have his authority and his muscle. And then last week I preached a message that was on the church again, the birth of the church. And what we looked at last week was there was three elements that were present there that day. And you're familiar with that. You've all heard it before. That there they were, all collectively, the disciples in the upper room. And all of a sudden, a wind came upon them. Uh, like a hurricane wind. It's so loud that it attracted people and had them coming outdoors to see what was happening. And then there was like something like tongues of fire. And we looked at that and we said, all right, God was sending a message. And here's the message. I'm starting the church. I'm starting the church with power. Wind represents power and the Holy Spirit. And so the church is sustained, began and sustained by the Holy Spirit of God. And then we looked at the fire. We said, well, what is the fire? Well, fire in the Old Testament represented purity, something that was refined by fire. It also looked at passion. And so we said, holy passion. And so the church was started with power. It was started with holy passion. What's with the tongues? What's the deal with that? Proclamation. And so the church has power and has holy passion to go out and proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. God was sending a message. This is how I'm starting the church. These are the things that I'm putting in there, and they need to be here today. Today, the Holy Spirit is the one still driving. Not only is he driving, we are to have a holy passion for God and for one another. And we are to proclaim Today, we're going to look at three crucial elements that must be there for a healthy church. Not only for a healthy church, but for healthy Christians. Three crucial elements. Now, for your body and my body, there are at least three crucial elements that you need. You will not live without them. You need air. You won't live very long without air. You need water. You won't live real long without water. And you need nutrition. You won't live real long without nutrition. We know that. But the body, the body of Christ, the church of which he is the head, needs three elements as well. That's the three elements that we look at today. So let me read our text. If you're there, open up. If you're not there, open up to Acts chapter 2. Starting in verse 41, Luke writes this. So then, those who had received his word were baptized, and that day there were added about 3,000 souls. Imagine how busy they were baptizing 3,000 people. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe. And many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common and they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all, as anyone might have need. A day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number, day by day, those who were being saved. These are the first steps of the baby church. And so I want you to see the first thing that we need for a healthy church. They needed it. We need it today. A healthy church must be continually devoted to God. Doesn't that make sense? You see, we must be continually devoted. What we read here is Luke tells us in verse 42, they were continually devoted devoting themselves and continually devoting themselves, they understood that this was constancy and consistency because this was something that they valued. Whatever you devote yourself to, you value greatly and you see great purpose in it. They saw great purpose in God's word, in God's prayer, and exalting their God. 
The first thing I want you to see is that they devoted themselves to the teaching of God's Word. Now I want to tell you, if you have 3,000 people coming to your church just like that, that's a pastor's dream. It's also a pastor's nightmare. Trying to work with 3,000 people. These people were from scattered from around the world. They were all there for the, the holiday of Pentecost. And some of them had stayed on. The church has been born. It went from 120 to 3120. Just like that. And it will continue to explode. As a matter of fact, they're still adding to it today. What did the disciples teach them? Ah, New Testament. Wasn't written yet. They had no New Testament. So what did they teach them? Well, I think what happened was the words of Jesus were ringing in their ears and teach them everything I taught you. Teaching them to obey. And so I guess that's where they started. Or possibly, like Jesus did with the disciples, he started in Moses, and they taught him about Jesus Christ, starting with Moses and going right on through the Old Testament. You do realize that the New Testament is rooted in the Old Testament, right? It's very unfortunate that we call it the Old Testament, because that's not true. It's very current. Jesus had also told the disciples, I will send you another counselor, and he will teach you, and he will remind you. So here you have common men, untrained, not theologically trained at all. Well, I guess they did go to seminary. Three years with Jesus would be better than anything, wouldn't it? But they didn't have the official training. They had something better. They had the Holy Spirit. And they were totally dependent on the Holy Spirit. There was nothing for them to reach back to. You see, the first act of the church was preaching. Peter stood up and he preached the word of God. How long did Peter preach? Don't know. You know, today that's a battle in a lot of churches. They, they fight over that. Um, how long should a sermon be? I saw an article on it recently. Well, I'm going to give you a personal opinion. If a pastor is preaching his words, I think it should be 10 minutes, 15 tops. Because I don't really care what he has to say. I do want to know what God says. The best Bible teachers I know of give great honor to God's word. And even though they've done it for 30, 40, 50, 60 years, they still give it 40 to 50 minutes on a Sunday morning to unpack what God is saying. And the people of God sit in awe of God's word because they know they're there to learn something. You see, they understand that God's word is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training for everything in our lives. They understand that we are counseled by God's word. But not only were they dedicating themselves, devoting themselves to God's word, but to worship as well. You'll see in the text that they talk that they were devoting themselves to not only the teaching of the disciples, but also fellowship and the breaking of bread. And so corporate worship. The breaking of bread here points to communion. And so they had communion together. Communion is a wonderful worship service because it reminds us exactly of what Jesus Christ did. That he came intentionally, purposely to die on the cross for our sins. Nobody killed him. He laid his life down freely for you and for me. And they understood that. And they understood that we we're all sinners. That we all deserve to go to hell. And they understood that Jesus Christ had released them from that, and by faith alone in Christ alone, they were transferred from hell to heaven for their eternal address. They understood that Jesus paid it all. Jesus was not the down payment, he was the full payment. That's something to celebrate. 
You go ahead and shut these people up. And so, in communion, what they would do is what we should do today. They would look back at the cross. And they would say, I worship you, Lord, because you paid it all for me. That gave them comfort because that burden had been lifted off of their backs. But it also gave them hope. Not only comfort, but hope. Because in the communion service, we have hope because we not only look back at the cross, we look forward to when Jesus returns. Isn't that wonderful? Any day now. Any day now. I'm not predicting, but I do know that it could be any day. Everything is in place. Nothing else needs to happen. And so we await Jesus today. It was also a time of contrition. And it still is today. When we have communion, we search our hearts. Lord, am I holding grudges against anybody? Is there anybody I need to forgive? Because if I don't forgive them, you won't forgive me. That's your word. And I'm just faking having any kind of communion with you. They understood that. I think they understood that worship is communication. Today, we struggle with that because we live in a spectator society. We sit in front of our TVs, we sit in front of a movie screen, we sit and we watch. And that's our life. We watch. You see, worship is interactive. Just a moment ago, you heard Bob say, Amen. Why does he do that? I know why he does that. Because he's interacting with God's word. He hears something that he says, amen to that. Let it be God. You see, it's interactive. Worship is interactive. God teaches us through preaching, and we praise him through singing. And through prayer, we approach him. They understood that, and they dedicated themselves to worship because it's communion and relationship with God. By his rules, not ours. Some say, I can worship any place. Well, I'm sure you can. But God commands that we worship together in church and not stop doing that. Amen. But you know what? <clears throat> One of the things that makes me sad and probably happened back then too is that some leave week after week after week of worship service completely unchanged, nonplussed. They may even criticize. Didn't like this. That was too long. That was too short. Wish we would have had more of this. Didn't really like that song. That was loud. Wasn't loud enough. And there's a lot of criticism. It's a well-known fact that people have the pastor for lunch every Sunday. That kind of thing. The problem with that is their problem is not with the pastor. It's with God. You see, if the pastor is teaching God's word, then their problem is with God not with him. You see, some come to worship and they think it's ritual. <sighs> but there's others, they think it's revival every Sunday. They come with expectations. Some think it's an obligation. Well, it's Sunday, got to go to church. Others see it as opportunity. An opportunity to witness God in a new way today. Some see it as drudgery. Others see it as delight. How do you see it? You see, you get what you expect. You reap what you sow. If you come here expecting nothing, you'll get it every time. <laughs> but if you come here expecting a word, not the word of God, but the word from God, you'll get it. Because God is faithful. You see, some do seek for the word of God. Others say, no, I want a word from God. I want a touch from God. Now, when I preach, I really don't expect you to listen to me. Okay? Why would you listen to me? You know, can, if I can be honest, my dog doesn't listen to me. <laughs> Any of you have that problem? Unless I have a pocket full of biscuits. <laughs> Now, all of a sudden, my dog is riveted on me because i got food for that dog. If I make a motion and she doesn't know the trick, she'll fake it. Because she wants to please me and she pays attention to every word because I have food for her. 
might be a good reason for you to listen on Sunday because I got food for you. They were also devoted to corporate prayer. You know, I don't know of a mature Christian, and when I say mature, I mean somebody who is humble, not somebody that's been in the church for 50 years. That doesn't mean you're mature. This is not rated by time spent. This is related by how God has impacted your life. How humble are you? How open are you? Are you contrite? Does, you, does your life show the fruit of the Spirit? Love. You love God. You love others. You show it. Joy, peace, patience, kindness. Are those things evident in your life routinely? That's a mature Christian. They understood and we know. I've never met a mature Christian that isn't dedicated to personal prayer and corporate prayer. Why is that? They understand that prayer is not a last resort. It's a first step. And so the early church knew that. Now, I want you to imagine talking to the disciples about this and them saying, we need to pray. And some of them saying, what do we need to pray for? Can't we just sing more songs? And the disciples would say, hold on one second there. Let me tell you what Jesus did. Now, can you remember? I only know one thing that the disciples asked Jesus to teach them. Now, you would think it was could you teach me how to do that miracle thing? Like where you command the sea? That's pretty cool. It wasn't. It was teach us to pray. Why was that? Well, I don't know for sure, but here's what I think. They saw Jesus pray and they saw something happen. They saw him pray, they saw it happen. They saw him pray, they saw it happen. They saw him pray, they saw it happen. They said, there's the power right there. It's in prayer. You ask God. Jesus said, until now, you've not asked for anything in my name. Ask, and I'll think about it. No. Ask, and you will receive, and your joy will be complete. James reminds us, you don't have. Why? Because you fail to ask. God wants us to ask. Well, if he knows everything, why do I have to ask him? Because he said so. And that's the way he works. God loves fellowship with us. And sometimes you're praying for something for years. And you think God's never going to hear you. And yet you look at your Bible and you say, I know it's His will. God's preparing your heart, but He's loving the time you spend with Him. Keep praying. Never, never, never give up. One of my professors is known internationally. He's passed away in the last few years. But I remember one of his stories. His father was an alcoholic, and he prayed for his father for four years. Nothing. Nothing. And finally, one day he got a phone call. His father had trusted Christ. Never give up. Never give up. Never give up. And so the early church understood that they wanted to dedicate themselves to God. They devoted themselves to God through the study of His Word, hearing His instruction, responding back to Him in worship, responding back to Him in prayer. They understood that they needed to ask. Now you may say, I'm not so sure I really need that prayer stuff. Let me explain it to you this way. It may help you a little bit. When a diver enters into the sea, when a deep sea diver enters into the sea, he enters into an alien world. It is not a world where he survives. And so for him to survive in this alien world, he must take a lifeline with him. We call that air. He needs something from his world in that world so that he can live in that world and function in that world. If you take that air away, he ceases to function. We know that. When you trusted Christ as your Savior, your address changed. This is not your home. Your home is up there. Your home is heaven. Peter says you're now an alien on this earth. You're living in an alien world. And you need a lifeline. Prayer. Prayer's your lifeline. The more you pray, the more you know 
God answers. Want to be a healthy Christian? Want to be a part of a healthy church? It's going to take a continual devotion to the Lord. It takes a steady diet of His Word, prayer, worship, and response. But to be well-rounded, it takes something else. The second thing the early church had and that we need, the healthy church must be continually devoted to God's people. Jesus summed up the entire Old Testament when the Pharisees were trying to trick him. What's the most important commandment, Jesus? You think you're so smart. And Jesus said, that's pretty simple. Love the Lord your God. With all your heart, soul, and strength. I want mind. Oh, and while you're asking me, let me give you just the second one. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. On this entire Old Testament, the prophets rest. You see, loving God and loving others is a big deal for God. Now, there are people who say, you know, I'm just not so happy about the church. I don't need church. A bunch of hypocrites hanging out there. Well, you know, there's always room for one more. <laughs> None of us is fully living up to what we believe, but we are trying. We're not perfect. So God's not interested in the perfection. He's interested in the direction that we're going. You know, when people say, I love the church, I just don't like the people. I love God, but I just don't like the people. You know, that would be like the bold young man who took a girl on the first date. She said, so uh, what do you love most about me? And he said, oh, your face hair, your ears, you're lovely. She said, well, what do you think about, you know, kind of the rest of me? He goes, well, I actually don't much like it. You're fat. <laughs> How many more dates will he get? <laughs> you can't just love the head. You have to love the body. And that's what God calls us to do, to love the body, too. And it's tough. It's very tough. You see, they had fellowship. They had the koinonia. Now, we look at that word and we go, oh yeah, I've heard that word. I know that Greek word. Well, all it means simply is that they had all things in common. They were together and they had all things in common. Now, to have things in common, to have real true fellowship, you need a couple of things. One thing you need is you need saving faith in Christ. You see, if you don't share the same spiritual DNA, you're not going to have that kind of close fellowship that they enjoyed. Let me ask you, have you ever been someplace, met somebody new, and you find out in the conversation that they're a Christian? And all of a sudden, there's a connection there, isn't there? You don't really know what it is, but it's something to do with you have a like faith. Yes, same Savior. You may not agree with everything that they do in theology, and they may not agree with you. But there's one God, one Savior, one Spirit. They had that. And they focused on that. And so they had that connection, that fellowship. So to have fellowship, you've got to be a believer if you're going to have close fellowship. The true fellowship requires that you must spend time together. Uh, for some reason, um, our son Sean likes to tease us. If he gets some really good filet mignons and he throws them on the grill, you know what he does? He sends pictures of them. <laughs> Here I am eating peanut butter and jelly. He's in Texas eating a filet mignon. You know, I'd have a lot better fellowship with him if I was there. I can see that steak, but I'm not having very good fellowship with that steak or with Sean at this point. I need to hear the sizzle. I need to taste it and smell the aroma. We need to be together. That's where fellowship comes. That's why we have fellowship events here. Some folks talk about, well, we don't want to invest in that. You know, these are opportunities for us to meet each other more. Rather than running in on Sunday morning and running out, we get a chance to have fellowship, to get to know people. Because there's folks here that you would quite frankly love very much if you got to know them better. And so true fellowship requires spending time together. They also had one mind. You'll see that Luke wrote that they had one mind. One mind means they were all headed in the same direction. They did not agree on everything, but they understood something. They had that one God, one Savior, 
one spirit, one faith, one direction. You know what God gave them? Praise and joy. Look at verse 46. Day by day, continuing with one another in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart. Verse 47, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. When we honor God, He honors us. And that's what He did here. They were honoring Him. They did what He said to do. And He honored them. You know, it was well said some 1,500 years later that gives us a picture of part of what was going on in this church. It was said by Philip Melanchthon. You may not know that name, but you know the name of Martin Luther, the great reformer. And Philip Melanchthon said this, in essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. In all things, charity. So he's saying on the things that are essentials, faith alone and Christ alone, we're all rock solid on that. We have one mind. But there's other things. Some in that group likely would have said, well, you can have wine. Others said, you can't. Some would say, I can do this. And they say, you can't. Others were still hung up on the law. And they say, well, you can't do this on the Sabbath. And the others would say, there is no Sabbath. <coughs> we celebrate on Sunday the resurrection of our Lord and Savior. And so in the non-essentials, freedom. But in everything, grace. Grace would abound to one another. That means I don't tell you how to live your life. You don't tell me how to live my life. That's what they did. Well, you can't have a beer after you cut the lawn. Well, I think I can. You show me in the Bible where it says I can't. And then somebody says, by the way, I don't like beer, so. Um, <laughs> never did. Um, just didn't like the taste of it. But it doesn't give us the right to judge others. To say, well, I think I can. That's freedom in Christ. Amen. A healthy church requires devotion to the Lord, requires devotion to His people. And one last thing. A healthy church must be continually devoted to God's work. And we see that in this passage. We see that they were dedicated to two things. God's work within the church and God's work <coughs> out of the church. Inside the church, they were selling possessions. This was not a commune. This is not socialism. They weren't selling everything they had. But if there were needs, they were selling their possessions to help out others. And so they looked out for one another's needs. This was the job of the church for many years before welfare became a deal in the United States. But even today, our church still, through our ministry uh, that we have here, through care ministry, through benevolence, we help people with needs. But not only that, they were, con they were uh, continually devoted to working God's work outside the church. Evangelism. You could not shut those people up. You ever find somebody that's a new Christian? Even some of you may say, oh man, I was, as a new Christian, I was on fire. Um, probably made a lot of people mad, but just couldn't shut me up. You see, when did they have their first evangelism class? They hadn't. They did understand that Jesus called them to be witnesses, to tell what they knew. And what happened, and this is why a lot of times new Christians will bring people to Christ. We should even be better at it. They're so excited about it. Their joy spilled over from the meeting place to the marketplace. Their joy spilled over. And they just couldn't tell enough people. Has that not happened to you? Many people say the same thing. When they came to Christ, there was a weight lifted off of their back. Before that time, they hoped there was a heaven and they prayed there was not a hell. But that weight was lifted off. These people felt the same thing. And they wanted their friends their family, the people they met, to have that same freedom. 
You see, we buy into today, you can't talk politics, you can't talk religion. We're not talking religion. We're talking a savior. You know, the world today, we're very concerned that we need a cure for Alzheimer's, and we do. We need a cure for cancer, and we do. But the church is irrelevant in many people's eyes. And yet, we have a cure that nobody else has. We have a cure to death. Death is separation from God for eternity. We have that cure. Brothers and sisters, don't forget. You know the cure to death. Share it boldly with others. Look for opportunities to talk to them. You know, if you had a relative, a child, or, or a grandchild, or a son, or a daughter, or a neighbor, and they were... They had cancer and they were dying. And you knew a cure for cancer. Would you withhold that from them? No, no, no. You would tell them. What if they said, oh, you're a quack. You don't know what you're talking about. That's not going to happen. What if? Wouldn't you go back and pray and look for opportunities to tell them, I can save your life. You would keep on them. Why don't we do that? Finally, I want you to realize and write these four things down. I think a good application out of this, one, write down five people you know who don't know Jesus. Just write their names down. Write down five people that you know that do not know Jesus that are in your life. Number two, pray for them every day. Pray for them. That the Lord would open up the eyes of their heart. And pray for boldness. Pray for an opportunity. And pray for the words to share with them. Number three, get a good track. We have them in the track rack back here. May I ask you a question? My favorite, because it's clear. And it's simple. And it's easy to understand. It doesn't use a bunch of Bible language that unbelievers don't understand. Fourth, invite them to church. Demonstrate the love of God. You say, hey, why don't you come to church with me? And then take them out to eat. You don't have to do that part, but it might give them a, two reasons to come with you on Sunday morning. You see, the problem with the church and why we need for people, or why we need a uh, need for all policy is that we have left our purpose. We have left why God made the church. We've gotten into, well, we're not so much about doctrine, we're more about feeling. And so folks are fed donuts on Sunday morning and by the afternoon they're hungry because those carbs just aren't going to satisfy. They're looking for meat and potatoes. That's what God's Word gives us. Pray for your neighbors. When a church moves from poor health to good health, it changes the community, it changes lives, it changes the world. That's why God has us here, to change the villages for Jesus Christ, to impact the villages for Jesus Christ and the world. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We ask that you would work in a mighty way. Lord, make this a healthy church, a revived church. A church where we understand more clearly that Jesus Christ died for us and all the world. And help us to take that responsibility personally to share with others. Because you put people in our lives. And so Lord, all the glory goes to you. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we have worshipped you in spirit and in truth. We have honored your word and now seal your word to our hearts. Oh Lord, have your way. Have your way in our lives. Lord, we thank you for your goodness. And now we pray to you who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works within us. To you, God, be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever. And never. Amen.